Good afternoon and welcome to our continuation of the series Brushing Up the Bard. This is the third lecture on Shakespeare's great tragedy, Hamlet. As I emphasized in the previous lecture, the famous soliloquies in Hamlet do not simply advance the plot of the text by taking the protagonist from suicidal despair to commitment to action, no matter how questionable that action may be. They also allow Hamlet to explore the contradictions, the complexities of his own being. The gracious, multifaceted Renaissance prince, the grieving, melancholy man, at times intensely contemplative, at other times frenziedly passionate. The jester figure using his antic disposition to satirize the corruption that encircles. All these elements are part of Hamlet's nature and obviously they cannot be rigidly separated. Yet, throughout the drama, he is struggling to reconcile these elements of his being in a situation in which emotion is heightened and corruption is entrenched. The setting right of a terrifyingly out of joint time requires of Hamlet not merely the killing of Claudius, but also a commitment to a state of being Hamlet wrestles with the intricacies of his own being, prince, avenger, fool, because a choice of selfhood is involved in the successful enacting of his father's commands. Yet simplifying his complex being is not easy or even desirable for Hamlet, for the very contradictions of his nature make him the intellectual hero that he is. In the famous closet scene in which Hamlet so savagely confronts his mother, we see the contradictions in his nature explicitly explored. He uses graphic sexual language in order to expose to Gertrude the realities of her own lust and infidelity. Confronted by such deliberately gross imagery, the rank sweat of an ensemed bed, Gertrude feels her guilt to be overwhelming, and she pleads with Hamlet for mercy. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in my ears. No more, sweet Hamlet. During the closet scene, in both his language and in his heated actions, the swift, unthinking stabbing into the arras, Hamlet seems to have succeeded in obliterating the complexity of his nature and transforming himself into the simple avenger who will easily drink hot blood. Yet, the ghost of Hamlet's father's reproachful reappearance prompts Hamlet to regain his gentleness and tenderness. He urges his mother to confess, to repent, and to confirm her repentance by denying sexual favors to the bloat king, Claudius. This compassion and kindness serve to re-establish Hamlet's appealing and virtuous humanity. It is so important to note that Shakespeare emphasizes the fact that no matter how much he strives to simplify his being, Hamlet cannot eliminate the complexities of his nature. He cannot be completely transformed into an avenger. The feminist critic Patricia Parker puts it wittily and well when she writes that Hamlet will always be in contrast to such one-dimensional emblems of masculinity as laities and the aptly named fort in bra, strong in arms. There is a marked change in Hamlet when he returns from the sea voyage. His antic disposition has been cast aside, his doubts, self-disgust, and the sore distraction of his melancholy seemed to have vanished. The connotations of the word naked that he uses in his letter to Claudius, newly born, unarmed, exposed to the truth, seem to confirm the confirmation. However, he has not become a Laertes or Fortinbras. He is not dedicated to unthinking violence alone. Rather, he is prepared to act only if a higher power is ordaining that he should act. 
Hamlet is now a willing instrument of the divinity that shapes our ends. He has achieved a wholeness through his submission to providence. The reason for this alteration is clear. Hamlet believes that his sleeplessness and his impulsive action in discovering Claudius's orders to the King of England were part of the pattern of this divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. He even regards the fact that he had his father's signet ring in his possession as heaven ordinant. The fact that the pirate spared his life, indeed treated him justly and mercifully, is also viewed as evidence of the workings of providence. He is convinced that heavenly order controls the fate of even the smallest of God's creatures. For the truly religious, for the devout, readiness for death is a supreme duty, and Hamlet now has this readiness. When referring to the fall of a sparrow, Hamlet echoes a beautiful and very famous passage from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Hamlet has now placed himself in God's hands. He will be the vengeful scourge and the healing minister of Denmark only if God wills that he play these roles. He knows that the paradoxes of his nature can be fully reconciled only by God, and he no longer attempts to force himself to play the stereotyped Avenger figure. He is prepared to wait to fulfill his heaven-directed destiny. His readiness for death is demonstrated in the gravedigger's scene, Act 5, Scene 1. Here he ponders the fact that human wealth, power, conquest, beauty and cunning all end in death and decay. Death equalises everybody. Conqueror, cunning lawyer, jester and fine lady. The linking of the dead jester Yorick with the world-conquering Alexander the Great and the dead Julius Caesar who might stop a hole to keep the wind away, underlines the central point of the scene, as does the skull of Yorick, the memento mori, reminder of death, here used in Hamlet for the first time. Hamlet's calm, humorous confrontation with the physical dissolution of death indicates his serenity of mind, his profound acceptance of mortality, his belief that, all chances are governed by the secret powers of God. Hamlet's wholeness is emphasized in other respects too. His expression of love for the dead Ophelia now shows his genuine commitment to her. Love is reasserted. The misogynistic, obscene jibes have vanished. Also, Hamlet's assertion, this is I, Hamlet the Dane, is an assertion of confident selfhood. His parody of Osric's pompous sycophancy shows an ease and lightness. It is free of disgusted fury, but not of satirical awareness. Hamlet is ready for whatever God's will dictates. He knows that his own deep plots previously imperiled his virtue, even endangered his soul. He is now fully prepared for whatever his destiny brings. Therefore, Horatio's requiem for Hamlet, now cracks a noble heart, is not sycophantic or exaggerated, but just. Having repented of the murder of Polonius, having been fully justified in killing Claudius, who has murdered Hamlet's father and arranged the death of Hamlet himself, and ready spiritually for death. Hamlet is indeed the sweet prince of Horatio's eulogy. Hamlet's final concern is that the honour of his name should be preserved after his death.
draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Horatio is convinced of Hamlet's calm surrender to divine guidance and judgment, which means that flights of angels will certainly sing this formerly tormented hero to his final rest. We have essentially completed our exploration of the central themes of Hamlet and of the extraordinary multifaceted character of Hamlet himself. Yet at the beginning of this lecture series, I said that I would do my best to glance at certain image patterns that run through this remarkable and remarkably complex play. So here we go. One of the central themes of Hamlet is the corrupting effect of evil. Claudius's sensuality and his ruthlessness create an utterly corrupted society. So his personal poison serves to poison an entire state. Private immorality becomes public immorality. Sycophantic courtiers accept Claudius. Spies and deceivers like Polonius, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern willingly serve him. Goodness and sensitivity are rejected. Hamlet is an outcast in the Danish court, or manipulated and destroyed. Think of the tragic plight of Ophelia. Images of disease, corruption, unnatural growth and poison proliferate throughout the play and underline the horrifying, timelessly relevant fact that evil can spread throughout a state once the state's leader is corrupted. Hamlet describes Denmark as an unweeded garden, overwhelmed by things rank and gross in nature. And both Ophelia, the Rose of May, and Hamlet, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, are throttled by the unnatural growth, power of the corrupted Danish state. Ophelia is constantly associated with flowers, with buds, the infants of the spring, violets, and the rose. And she is explicitly depicted as a victim of the spiritual weeds that infest Denmark. She dies adorned with weedy trophies, destroyed by the corruption of the state. The ghost of Hamlet's father calls the poison that ended his life a leprous distillment. It produced a vile and loathsome crust on his smooth body. The imagery is of unnatural, agonizing infection of what was previously pure. There is also a link between the disease imagery that dominates the text and imagery of warfare. The poison holds an enmity within the blood of man and invades the natural gates and alleys of the body. So the king's body is seen as a microcosm of his state. It is compared to a citadel stormed by an enemy, and the poison that kills Hamlet's father flows through the whole of Denmark, corrupting it. War images are emphasized in other sections of the play as well. Claudius's fear and defensiveness after the play scene and the killing of Polonius express themselves in war images that reveal both his insecurity and his determination to protect his power. He is afraid that the blame for Polonius's death may fall on him as level as the cannon to his blank, which means as directly and accurately as a cannon firing at point-blank range. He relies on the recent and still painful memories, the scars of war and defeat, to force England to obey his orders to kill Hamlet. He describes troubles as assaulting him, not as single spies, but in battalions, and he feels attacked on all sides as if by a murdering peace, a cannon firing grape shot that spreads widely. Such imagery is very appropriate to a man who constantly feels threatened and yet is determined to defend his ill-gotten gains. Hamlet himself uses war imagery rather differently. 
His images of warfare relate to the division within his own psyche or soul and are a significant way of expressing one of the tragedy's central themes, the difficulty of reconciling morality and practicality, action and thought, spiritual life and earthly desire. So, in the magnificent to be or not to be soliloquy, Hamlet debates the conflicting merits of the contemplative life and the active life, and he speaks of taking arms against a sea of troubles, which is not a mixed metaphor, as some critics claim, but rather a reference to the King Canute-like difficulty of struggling against the host of sufferings inflicted upon humanity. Hamlet also speaks of his mother's sensuality, her sexual desires, as forces of unnatural rebellion. They mutine, they mutiny in a matron's bones, and he plans to make her feel guilt about her lasciviousness by speaking daggers to her. Hamlet's war imagery contrasts significantly with the war imagery of the self-serving, desperately defensive Claudius. Theatrical imagery also plays an important part in Hamlet. The theatre can, after all, deceive or enlighten, just as human behaviour can be truthful or treacherous and corrupt. Hamlet's famous advice to the actors not to overplay, tear a passage to tatters, not to distort the text in order to allow a range for their own egotistical comic routines, not to underplay either, be not to tame neither, is a reminder to them of what the fundamental aim of the theatre is, to reveal the truth about humanity and human existence to the audience, to hold, as twere, a mirror up to nature. Hamlet thus uses art, the theatre in this case, to reveal concealed truth about life. And this is the true aim of art. If bombast, verbosity, melodramatic language and theatrical flourishes, all contained in the murder of Gonzago, can expose the guilt of Claudius, then theatre has certainly fulfilled its real purpose. Hamlet, the character, certainly understands that the aim of all art is to use all possible methodology to reveal the truth about all of us. Let's pause. I now have to focus on a rather complex figure of speech that you need to understand, for it is certainly common in Hamlet, and that is Hendiadus, spelt H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S. Hendiadus can be defined as the balanced pairing of two nouns on occasions on which it would be more usual to use an adjective and a noun. Often Hendiadus underlines a concept's dual nature by juxtaposing an abstract noun with a more concrete noun. For example, Ophelia describes Hamlet as the expectancy and rose of the fair state. Now, expectancy is an abstract, suggesting that Hamlet is Denmark's source of hope. But rose is a very concrete image, stressing the qualities that make Hamlet Denmark's expectancy. His rare goodness, his nobility, his perfection. In the to be or not to be soliloquy, Hamlet speaks of the whips and scorns of human cruelty to emphasize the pain and suffering of life. The noun scorns is abstract. It is an example of the form that cruelty can take in earthly existence, the form of others' contempt and rejection of us. Whips, however, is a very concrete image indeed. On other occasions, hendiadus is used for dramatic emphasis, not for an extension of meaning, for the nouns can be outright synonyms 
having the same meaning. Examples of such use of Hendiadus are Hamlet's use of book and volume of my brain. After he has heard the truth about his father's death, he says that the ghost's words alone will remain within his memory. And he uses the repeated metaphor, book and volume, to underline how the ghost's account will dominate his memory. Another example of Hendiadus using synonyms is the first player's use of whiff and wind to describe the slashing blow of Pyrrhus's sword. Here the synonyms intensify the sense of horror as the sweeping motion of the fell evil weapon is emphasized. At other times, Hendiadus expresses two aspects of the same thought. A striking example is Polonius's use of with windlasses and assays of bias in his instructions to Rinaldo. Windlasses are roundabout, dishonest actions. Assays of bias mean devious probing or questioning. Both underline Polonius's nature as a plotter who will use any methods to gain what he desires. This discussion of Hendiadus and its effects is not designed simply to make you feel erudite or superior. Rather, it is designed to indicate to you how Shakespeare uses such a brilliant treasure trove of figures of speech in order to communicate his meaning. It is absolutely impossible to explore all the image patterns in Hamlet. It is such a multifaceted and brilliant text. But I hope that I've managed to alert you to some of them. Disease imagery, war imagery, theatrical imagery, and the use of Hendiadus. Those are the aspects on which I focused. And so we can now conclude our discussion of this inexhaustibly rich and extraordinary text. I trust you have enjoyed being with me and I look forward to engaging with you again on another occasion. Thank you very much.